Recently, in one of my sermons, I shared the following. My mother taught me as a youth that I should never say I hate you to anybody. She further instructed that if you say I hate you, it's like saying I want you dead. It's that strong. Some of you may remember that sermon, or parts of that sermon, or at least that saying. As you listen to it once again, some of you might say, Mom's lesson feels good. It sounds like Jesus. Never say I hate somebody. And yet we read in the Gospel lesson that Kristen just read, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife, husband and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Does that really sound like Jesus? Seriously. Unless we've studied it, unless we've already gained some understanding, the first reading of that passage, unless you hate and listing all the most intimate relationships that we have in our day-to-day -day living, in our lives. The first family. It just doesn't sound like Jesus. That was the conclusion of the Tuesday Bible study. There are always the litmus test as we study and look at the passage I'm going to preach on to help me know the impact of the words. And even after... I explain some of the details that I'll be explaining in my sermon. Tuesday group kept coming back to say, but why use the word hate? It just doesn't seem to fit. I'd like to suggest there are two steps in understanding this. One step, and it's, I promised to do this when the Tuesday group and I met, check other translations. Is there a better English word for the Greek that it was written in. And second, to look at other biblical references. How is the word hate used in other portions of the Bible? So I did that. I checked out biblical references. If you've never looked at it, and if you have a computer, BibleGateway.com. It's an amazing tool, truly. BibleGateway.com, and it has, I didn't count them all, but it's somewhere in the range of 30 to 40 English translations of the Bible. I didn't try to look through all of them, but I looked through 25 of them. And of the 25, this passage, 17 modern translations still include the word hate, just like the New International Version that we just read from. 17 out of 25. A big proportion. Eight introduce different words and or an explanation. Of the eight, I'll offer these examples. It's the assumption is in the Bible when you read the word hate, it's not the feeling, the visceral response. It's not the emotional. What, what hate oftentimes evokes in our everyday language. I mean, sometimes we can say that it's okay, and it's even former president, it was okay to say he hated broccoli. And it stands out, doesn't it? Because public figures don't oftentimes use the word hate. It's a strong word. To describe our feelings at times, I hate it, you know, a vegetable, I hate when this happens. I hate when the computer doesn't talk to the printer. You know, we, we have this kind of description when we have strong feelings, don't we? But you see, when we read in the Bible to hate your mother and your father, it's not talking about the emotional dynamics of hating. Now, sometimes, sadly, within family systems, hate creeps in. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. And what Jesus is talking about, stated simply, and then reinforced with these other translations where they include different language, 
is the idea of love less. We've heard the expression first love. First love might be in a relationship. First love might be something you're particularly interested in. My first love is this. I work in this area, but my first love is something different. I remember a gentleman that I knew years ago who had a very high and well-positioned executive position, but in college he had studied plants. And his first love was plants, and that was reflected in his garden and planting, because that's where his real interest was, even though his job and how he provided for his family was a different area. So the idea is loving less. How does that fill in? You cannot be my disciple unless you love me more than you love your father and mother, your wife, your husband and children, and your brothers and sisters. You cannot come with me unless you love me more than your life, you love your own life. See, it's a different way of understanding, a different language to depict the concept. You can't have two first loves. Jesus is saying, if you are going to be my disciple, your first love has to be me. And everything else is subordinate to that because it is not the first. There's only one first. Another translation, good news for modern man, which we used to have in our pews. Once when a large crowd of people were going along with Jesus, he turned and he said to them, those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother, husband and wife, children, brothers and sisters, and even themselves. So it's stated in this one, in the positive. If you want to be my disciple, you need to love me more than anything else in your life. Strong teaching. Does this sound more like Jesus? And why do they use the word hate in so many of the translations? Well, here's one explanation. The word hate is an exaggerated figure of speech indicating a lesser degree of love, not actual hostility or aversion towards one's earthly family. The word hate pops out at us. It's exaggerated. And it's exaggerated on purpose to get our attention. You can imagine, as Jesus is walking, and he's during a time when he is in a popular stage of his, of his ministry. Why? Because it says large cloud, crowds are following him. And he turns and says, unless you hate, whoa, that's not the Jesus I've been listening to. Right? To get their attention. We'll come back to that. Other biblical references. Genesis chapter 29, 30. And he, Jacob, went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened up her womb, but Rachel was barren. Jacob and Rachel and Leah. Again, if we know the story, we can put it into a larger context. Jacob flew, fled from his brother Esau because Esau was stronger and he was going to kill him. He hated his brother, in this case, it was visceral, because Jacob had tricked Esau out of his birthright. And so he was ready to literally kill his brother. Cain and Abel is the first example of family sibling rivalry to that degree. So Jacob flees. He's pretty smart with his herdsmanship. Okay, he knows how to pay attention to breeding and, and, and get a good, a good result. And so his future father-in-law recognizes this and says, okay, you don't have anything. You're a nomad. You just came in with, with your stick and, and whatever you could carry on your back. But if you work for seven years, I'll give you one of my daughter's hand in marriage. 
Well, Jacob was attracted to Rachel. So he worked for seven years. Morning after the wedding ceremony, surprise, you're married to Leah. Wait a second, how did this happen? Well, Leah's the firstborn. She has to be married before her, daughter, her younger sister can be married. Another seven years. 14 years working for his father-in-law in order to gain the benefit of having now two wives. And he simply said, he loved Rachel more. And God's response was he hated her. Not that he physically hated her, despised her, wanted to throw her out of the family, get a divorce, etc. It was a lesser love. He had a greater love for Rachel than for Leah, so God blessed Leah, opening the door. Other places, the use of the word hate. Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold one up and despise the other. And again, it's greater and lesser. You can't have two first loves. Such extremes of feeling would be, would, were not meant to be taken literally, but rather a description of what's first, what's the highest priority. And this was, as we reviewed recently in the previous sermon, that God said, Jacob did I love and Esau did I hate. When in fact, yes, Jacob, the father of, of Israel, Jacob became Israel, the 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob was chosen, he was the greater, he was loved by God. Esau was loved less, but Esau was also blessed and he became the leader of the Edomite nation. So you see, it wasn't a visceral response where God looked at Esau and said, oh, he's, he's awful, disgusting. But it was rather, there's only one first. So the language of hate is to reinforce how important that internal decision is for us in response to Jesus. If you want to be my disciple, a follower, you must hate, hold at as a lesser love, even your family, and put me first. And the strength of the language helps us as human beings to avoid rationalization. See, so again, Jesus was at a popular point. Why was he popular? Because he was preaching a message of love. He was preaching a message of hope. Not only that, he was feeding the hungry. I mean, again, imagine you're part of the 5,000 and you just sat down and you ate perhaps the best bread you ever ate in your life and your stomach's full and Jesus is teaching. You sit back and boy, isn't this wonderful? I could, I, this could go on forever. Right? Or, or your loved one died. The family whose daughter dies. And he says, no, no, she's sleeping. And they laughed at him. No, you don't know. We know dead when we see dead. And just said, no. And she came back to life. She was raised from the dead. What joy that family would have at that moment. Healing. Feeding the, uh, feeding the sick. Giving hope to those who are oppressed. Large clouds, crowds were attracted to this positive teaching. And they're sitting back going, this is great. More of this, please. But then he turned. And with this strong language, he said, you want to truly be my disciple? You need to hate. You need to prioritize. There's only one first love in your life. Love me. Love my Father. Love the Spirit. And it's really another way of saying one of the two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your efforts. You see, we hear that in a positive way, and it's like, yeah, that's nice, that sounds like Jesus. But did it get our attention? Do we realize the cost of following Jesus? 
to be a true disciple of Jesus. And that's why I believe the use of the word hate is used. There is a cost to following Jesus. All our relationships need to be ordered behind Jesus. Even our beloved families, even following the second commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus is even saying, even your own life, put that subordinate, put that second to loving me. Jesus asked, and he continues to ask, are you willing to do this? One commentator expanded this truth as follows, and I read, quote, Jesus is not teaching a new commandment of hating people. He is teaching about the cost of following him. The clue is in Luke 14, 33, when Jesus says, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, he cannot be my disciple. It's about what we must be prepared to do to follow Jesus. It's about giving up everything, even our very lives. He doesn't say, by doing this, you'll get to heaven. Jesus clearly teaches that through faith in him, we have eternal life. Through his death on the cross, we have forgiveness of sin. However, as his followers, as his disciples, are we willing to place him first, the place most important, above important people in our lives? And not a command. It's a reordering of our lives. Not about salvation. That's a gift from God. But it's a greater and lesser love and placing our love of God, number one. This is the cost of being Jesus' disciples. Jesus lived out this truth. Your mother and brothers are here. Popular time of teaching. Jesus took, took that opportunity and said, who's my mother? Who's my brothers? The ones who obey my Father in heaven, they're my mothers, they're my brothers. Obedience. And Jesus was obedient even to death on the cross. If Jesus had a conversation with Mary and said, Mary, by the way, I want to fill you in on the plan that God has given me, the truth that God has revealed about who I am and my life. And Mary, I'm going to be crucified. How do you think that message would have gone over for Mary? Again, recently, Carol's mother shared with me, you never expect to bury your child. You never expect to bury your grandchild. They're supposed to be there to take care of you in your old age. Jesus, given as a gift from God, I was obedient. The angel came to me, what do you mean you have to die? before me. And even if she was accepting of it, can you imagine the pain that that represented for her? Did Jesus care about his mother? Absolutely. Did Jesus have love and emotion and affection for his mother? Absolutely. And that's why hanging from the cross, he looked at his mother standing by along with the apostle John and he said, woman, behold your son referring to John, and John, behold your mother. Why? Because he cared about his mother. But even his love for his mother could never go before his commitment to love God first and to be obedient, even obedient to death on the cross. And what we realize is that that ultimate price is paid by some martyrs to this day. There are individuals who put their life on the line and they literally die because they put Christ first in their life. But God doesn't call that for all of us. I mean, the rich young man came, and Jesus knew his wealth was a barrier. And he said, yep, yeah, you've done great. You've done the commands. One thing you lack. Sell everything. Come and follow me, and you will be part of my kingdom. And the rich young man turned away sad because he had great wealth, and he couldn't let go of his wealth to put Jesus first. And what does it say in the passage? As he walked away from Jesus, 
It said Jesus loved him. But that young man was not able to pay the cost of being a disciple. And the lessons continue in the Bible. After the resurrection, Peter said, let's go fishing. And it's, it's like all the lessons went out of their brain. Sometimes I have to admit, I can relate to that. You know, in the moment, it's like, oh goodness, what a weekend. What a week. Yeah, we've seen Jesus, and yeah, it's getting, getting better, but you know, let's just go fishing. Let's go back to what we're good at. Let's go back to what we're familiar with. And again, as they fished all night, and nothing, they got nothing, they got skunked. A stranger on the shore says, throw your nets on the other side. That always sounds odd to us. But in the context, it's understood that sometimes schools of fish would have just be breaking the water. So because of the angle of vision from the, from the shore, you could actually see the breaking of water. They could say, yeah, there's fish on the other side of the boat. So it was both practical as well as miraculous. Why? Because when they obeyed the stranger's invitation to throw their nets on the other side, Peter had the largest catch of his life. A lifelong fisherman, and now he is to the point where the boat almost sank. They had to call out the other boat. The nets were almost breaking. They dragged this huge, huge pile of fish onto the shore. And then Jesus has a conversation. So Peter, see these fish? The commerce it represents, the success of your night's work, being a fisherman, being successful, doing well, everything. Peter, by the way, do you love these fish? Do you love your success? Do you love being a great fisherman more than me? If you love me, follow me. First place. An exaggerated figure of speech indicating a lesser degree of love that is overshadowed by a greater expression of love. The first response may be, okay, Gary, it's a little clearer. Based on our looking at the language and looking at our other passages of Scripture, it's clearer. I get it better. I have a better understanding. Yes, that sounds more like Jesus. But can I do it? How will this truth change the balance of this day, perhaps redirection of my life, the coming week, leading into the next month, into the next year. And simply stated, it can only be accomplished by surrendering and inviting the power of the Holy Spirit. One person honestly came to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, help my non-belief. And for those of us who want to recommit or commit perhaps for the first time to putting Jesus absolutely number one in our life, we can pray that prayer. Lord, I do believe, overcome my doubt. Gracious God, I want to put you first in my life. I want to love Jesus first. I want to be obedient. I want to be willing to pay the cost of following you by your Spirit. Empower my life so that how I live, my obedience and my walk reflects that truth.